The scripture reading before the lesson will come from Acts 16, 14 through 15. Again, that's Acts 16, 14 through 15. I'll be reading from the King James Version. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Did you know that the word hospitality is in the King James Version of the New Testament four times? Let's take the time to read each one and see what we can discover. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12. Let's see what Romans chapter 12 and verse 13 says according to the King James Version. Romans 12, 13 says, distributing to the necessity of saints given to, if you read the King James, what does it say? Hospitality. Every member of the church ought to show generosity and kindness. That's the idea of hospitality to all people. When you look at this, it does say distributing to the necessity of saints, but in this context, it's a little bit broader than that. So we ought to show kindness and generosity to all people, thus saith the Lord. From where? Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and we'll come across the second time we find this word hospitality. In 1 Timothy 3 verse 2 with the qualifications of bishops or elders or pastors or overseers, however you would like to refer to them. But observe what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 and verse number 2. A bishop then must be, observe, that must is an imperative, be is in the present tense. That means right now. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, and here it is, given to hospitality, meaning this is part of his disposition. This is part of his demeanor. And the verse continues, apt to teach. All those are must imperative, be present tense as in right now. The third time is a few pages over in the book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse number 8, which is also with the qualifications of elders. Titus 1 and verse 8 says, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, Temperate. So being given to or a lover of hospitality is a relative qualification, meaning it is possessed and demonstrated by degree. However, if a man is without some degree of hospitality at the present time, then he does not satisfy the qualifications needed to serve the local congregation in the capacity of an elder. Now, we generally will stick with those, but don't forget Romans 12 and verse 13. That's not limited to the eldership. But it is a qualification given by inspiration of God for men to be considered for the office or the position or the work of an elder. But recall that it is by degree that it must be possessed. Last time is in 1 Peter chapter 4. Observe what the Bible says in 1 Peter 4. And verse number 9. 1 Peter 4, 9 in the King James Version says, Use, there it is again, and it's in the Bible. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. So generosity and kindness, that's the main two main ideas behind hospitality, is to be accomplished without grudging. You know what grudging is? It's complaining under your breath. Some people will do nice things for other people. And then they'll talk about you when you're not who you think you are. What does 1 Peter 4, 9 say? Use hospitality one to another without 
grudging, without murmuring, without complaining about having to do something kind and generous for someone else. We're doing our very best to understand and implement the various expectations placed upon us by God through the New Testament scriptures in order to be considered faithful servants of righteousness. Today, let's consider three different examples of hospitality from the New Testament. Now, while we're not going to read the exact word hospitality from any of these texts that we're going to consider, not that we've already not considered it because we have, but we're going to answer the question of what does hospitality look like? We can go back to those same four texts and we can define it. We can do all that type of work. But sometimes the best way to understand what something is is to see it in action. Did you know that hospitality is demonstrated in the New Testament? Indeed it is. So we're going to answer the question, what does hospitality look like? From three different texts within the New Testament. So our sermon this morning is entitled, Faithful in Hospitality. There are three different texts that we're going to examine this morning. The first one comes from Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. What we're going to see here, we're going to see the example of the good Samaritan. In other words, we're going to see hospitality demonstrated toward the sick. Hospitality demonstrated toward, in the first place, the sick. Let's pick up in Luke 10 and verse number 25 and get it in its context. And behold, a certain lawyer, that's an expert in the law of Moses, stood up. That seems to be one way to get attention in the first century. Today, by and large, we raise our hands or perhaps we just even speak out stood up and tempted or tested him, Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Who places it in the context of eternal life? Jesus didn't. This certain lawyer places everything that we're going to read in the context of what? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, he, Jesus, said unto him, Now observe what the Lord does. What is, he didn't say, what do you think? He didn't say, what do you feel? What did the Lord say? The answer to the question of what must I do to inherit eternal life is written down. Jesus said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? What he's saying is, what does the Bible say and how do you understand what the Bible says? Just to see if he's got it right. And incidentally, you're going to see some great questions and answers in this context. Verse 27, and he, this certain lawyer, answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor is thyself. Does that sound like a pretty good answer? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Love God with all and love my neighbor as myself. Now how does Jesus respond to that in verse 28? He, Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast answered. How did he answer? You got it. You, hit the, you didn't almost hit it. You hit the nail right on the head. Thou hast answered right. This Discuss, this, think about, mm, what Jesus say? This do, this do, and thou shalt live. Live how? Live forever. Live forever. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now observe verse 29, but, and you see but, there's a contrast coming most of the time. But he, this certain lawyer, now here we see his true motivation. Willing to justify himself. Meaning he knew what the Bible said. He answered it right, but he knew there was something missing. He wasn't doing something. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? That's a great question. And incidentally, we're going to see a great answer in the form probably of a parable. Observe verse 30. And Jesus answering. Notice Questions were asked, and what did the Lord do? He turned around and walked off, right and wrong. Jesus had an answer. Jesus answering said, a certain man. It does not say that he's a Jew. It does not say that he's a Gentile. It really doesn't matter. But if you see in the, in the eye of your mind, what do you see this man to be? What color is his skin? And would it really matter? Would it really matter what color his skin is? A certain man went down, geographically accurate, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, that's his clothing, and wounded him and depart, departed, rather, leaving him what? It doesn't say 
whole dead. It says it departed, leaving him half dead. This man is not dead. This man's soul and spirit, his immaterial aspects have not departed from his body, so he is alive, but he is suffering. From a broad perspective, he's sick. Now, who's going to show hospitality to this man? Who's going to show generosity and kindness to this certain man who's done nothing wrong, just went about his life, and now he's in trouble? Who's going to demonstrate hospitality? And what does hospitality look like? Well, let's see. What happens in verse 31, and by chance, meaning God didn't predetermine this. This, did, this was not predetermined. It just so happened in the process of life. By chance, there came down a certain priest. You know what they did? These were really the sons of Aaron. These were the ones who offered the sacrifices. These were the religious-minded people of the children of Israel, wouldn't you think? A certain priest that way. And when he saw him, what did he do? Jesus told him this do. Love God with all and love your neighbor as yourself. You do this and you'll live forever. Now the priest saw him. He could tell, perhaps he could tell he wasn't whole dead, but that he's half dead. He passed by on the other side. Now we can give excuse after excuse. We could give reason after reason. Priests couldn't touch dead bodies. This ain't a dead man. This man is not dead. He had to go about his priestly duties, didn't he? I'm sure he did, but do you understand the principle of qualification? And the matters of weightier judgment? You ought to look at Matthew 23, 23. You got to go to worship, I understand that, but there's a man there who needs help. What should we do? What did he do? They didn't say he prayed for him. Maybe perhaps he did mutter a prayer on his way off. But friends, what did he do? He did nothing. Well, there's strike one. Verse 32, likewise a Levite. Now all the priests were Levites, but not all the Levites were priests. The Levites were involved with the priestly service, but they were not priests themselves. So this really is another religious-minded man right here. Right? Now we're going we're to see what hospitality looks like right here, right? Let's see. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. You know what that implies? This Levite got a little closer. The priest, perhaps, just stayed on the other side of the road. This Levite comes and, and could perhaps tell that he's not whole dead, that he's half dead. So he came probably a little closer. But let's see what he did. When he was at the place, came and looked on him. What did he do? Pass by on the other side. Boy, doesn't that sound like loving your neighbor as yourself right there? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Love God with all and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the priest demonstrated that, didn't he? No. Did the Levite demonstrate what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself? No, because if that was me right there bleeding, if that was your mama, if that was your daddy, if that was your brother, if that was your sister, if that was your child, what would you do then? Here we are. What does hospitality look like? It doesn't look like the priest. It doesn't look like the Levite. Well, we got strike two. Down, we got one to go. Let's see what happens. But, notice that but, there's a contrast. A certain Samaritan, brief background. Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 721, maybe 722 B.C. and deported some Jews while importing some Gentiles. You can read about that in 2 Kings 17, 24. Now, who were the Samaritans? The Samaritans are the result of the remaining Jews intermarrying with the Gentiles. And by this time in the first century, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. According to the Samaritan woman at the well, John 4 and verse number 9. So on the Jews' social totem pole, so to speak, the Samaritans are way on down there, if not the very bottom of the rung. But what happens here? A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, you know what that means? It just so happened. It wasn't that God foreordained all this to happen. It just so happened in the course of life. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he didn't pass by on the other side. What does hospitality look like? And had compassion on him. What's hospitality look like? 
I'd mark that word, compassion, and went to him and bound up his wounds. What did he say? Oh, he might have some type of a blood disease. There, I, might, I might catch something and take it home to my children. There's no concern of that in this man's mind, is there? Now, I'm not saying he didn't put something on his hands, but it didn't. all the blood, by, by implication, didn't stop him, did it? Did it stop him? He could have said, I got children at home. I don't want to take home some disease to my kids. What did he do? You want to see what hospitality looks like? We're going to have to look at this certain Samaritan because the priest and the Levite struck out. Here's what hospitality looks like. Went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, antiseptic and uh, treatments to try and help his wounds. Pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end. And here's another one you need to look up. Ta and took care of him. What does hospitality look like? Compassion. What does hospitality look like? Took care of him. That's right there in the text, isn't it? Now all these were remedies to prevent infection. And this is how to implement hospitality. We're going to have to get our hands dirty. We're going to have to get in there among the sick, among those who are suffering. And we might have to just get our hands dirty in order to demonstrate Bible hospitality. Verse 35, And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence. This seems to be two days' wages. It perhaps would have covered up the three weeks of care for this hurting certain man. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, what, what do you see again? What is hospitality? What is it? Take care of him. He didn't say pray for the man, though that wouldn't be bad. But this man is bleeding, wounded, and he says what? Here's some money, generosity, take care of him. And when, whatsoever rather thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Both these men were men of integrity. Here, I'm going to give you of my means to take care of, by implication, this man I have never seen before in my life, but he's my neighbor. He's my neighbor. And the Bible teaches, you want to inherit eternal life, you love God with all, but you love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 36, watch Jesus. Great question. He got him hemmed up now, doesn't he? Yeah. You're not going to make a fool out of Jesus. Not then and not today. Which now of these three? What's your choices? You got a priest, you got a Levite, and you got a Samaritan. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Why, what would you say to that? Isn't that obvious? I mean, anybody, anybody can read or even halfway pay attention. That's obvious. Verse 37, and he said, he that showed mercy. I'd, I'd probably mark that too. What does hospitality look like? You're seeing it right here in action. You don't read the word hospitality in the text, but what does it look like? It looks like what the good Samaritan did to this certain man who fell among the thieves on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. He said, he that showed mercy on him. Watch, you want to see a powerful application? Here it is. This is the best one you'll see. This is the best one you're going to see. Then said Jesus unto him, go, did he say, and talk about it? He didn't say talk about it. Did he say discuss it amongst yourselves? That's not what he said. Did he go say write a paper on it? Did he go say, what did he say? He said go and do. Thou. That's on an individual level likewise. Friend, it was time for this certain lawyer to implement all his correct answers. You see that? It's time for us to do the same. Now, a brief observation. You might want to observe that those words, compassion, care, took care of, mercy, those kind of things. What does hospitality look like, friends? Hospitality demonstrates compassion and care to those who are sick and suffering. We don't just talk about it. We do it. We give of our time. We give of our talents. We give of our treasures. What does it look like? The first one is the Good Samaritan from Luke 10. Now, the second one, let's consider another example. Turn me to the book of Acts chapter 16. What does hospitality look like? Well, we can define the word, but we need to see examples. And let's look at the example of Lydia in Acts 16, verses 14 and 15. And what we'll see here is hospitality is to be demonstrated toward the servants. First it was the sick, the 
Second one now is toward the servants. Acts 16, 14 says, And a certain woman named Lydia, that's her name, she was a seller of purple. And purple was a very expensive dye. So it's reasonable to conclude that Lydia probably made a pretty good living. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. We're a long way off from Thyatira. You look where Philippi and Thyatira are on the Bible map, and you'll see where she's a, she's a long way from home. Of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God to the best of her ability, heard us. Now observe this phrase here, whose heart the Lord opened. What does that mean? Well, it means that the Lord opened her heart. Now, that's pretty self-explanatory. So the what is really not the question. The question we have is how. The what is given, but how was her heart opened? Well, the answer is it was by the message which was preached by Paul. It was not by some mysterious or unexplainable phenomenon. She had her heart opened by the message of the gospel. You know what still opens hearts? The message of the gospel. Whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. She paid attention to gospel preaching. Verse number 15, and when she was baptized. Now we ask, why was Lydia baptized? Well, the answer is given in Acts 2.38, and it hadn't changed all the way throughout the book of Acts. And in fact, has it changed into this present day and hour? Lydia was baptized for the remission of sins so that her past sins would be washed away and so that she would no longer be a sinner but a saint added by the Lord to the church. Acts 2.38, 41, and 47. Why was Lydia baptized? Well, even in the immediate context, who was preaching? My Bible says, the, whose heart the Lord opened at the end of verse 14, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So it seems to me that the Apostle Paul sure was preaching baptism, wasn't he? Indeed he was. So what, what compelled Lydia to be baptized but the things which were spoken of Paul? Why would Paul preach baptism? Because he understood you have to be baptized scripturally in order to go to heaven, in order to have your sins washed away. But notice it says, and her household. We'll talk about that in a minute. She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord. Now this is an account of conversion, but we're also looking at it as an account of hospitality. What does hospitality look like? Come into my house. What does hospitality look like? Come into my house and abide. And she constrained us. You know what that means? She wouldn't take no for an answer. Paul and then perhaps tried to say, well, we're going to go. No, 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 you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right here. She constrained us. Now, look back at that. She was baptized and her household. In this instance, baptized is used as a synecdoche. That is, the part is given for the whole gospel plan of salvation. We understand, if you've ever been through the book of Acts, that in the gospel plan of salvation is you have to hear the gospel. You have to believe the gospel. You have to repent of sin. You have to confess Jesus Christ. Then you're immersed in water for the remission of sins. Now some people try to say her household includes small infants. Well, can they hear the message of the gospel? Can they believe the message of the gospel? What would a small infant child have to repent of? Nothing. And how could a small infant child confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? So where it says Lydia and her household... That implies those of her household who were old enough to have sinned, number one, but also to understand the message of the gospel and freely confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So neither this verse nor any other teaches the false doctrine of infant baptism. That's a false doctrine. They don't need to be baptized. They're all right. Baptism is for those who have sinned and need salvation. So don't, don't try and use Lydia. Don't let anybody try and use Lydia or her household as an example of infant baptism. But I wondered about this myself. Laying all the conversion things aside, look at the end of verse 15. If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Was it a nice house? Did she have a big house? How big a house was it? Did she have to vacuum first? Did she have to start dusting off everything? 
So she said, wait a minute, y'all wait right here and let me go. It, it, no, no, no indication of any of that. She saw the servants of the Lord. She saw, look, you guys are on your evangelistic journey. Let me tell you where you're going to stay for a while. You're going to stay with me. What does hospitality look like? Come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, meaning there is, you ain't going to argue with Lydia. This is what it is. This is where you're staying. And the implication is that's where they stayed. Now, what does hospitality look like? Hospitality demonstrates itself by opening the doors of our homes and being kind, even to those without major problems. Did you know that you could demonstrate hospitality to people who aren't sick? Mind blown. Then you don't have to wait till something's wrong with someone to be generous and kind. What was wrong with Paul and his companions here? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with them. They, matter of fact, they helped out Lydia's spiritual condition, didn't they? Yes, they did. So we can demonstrate hospitality to the servants. Now in the third place. Let's consider the example of Onesiphorus. Is that in the Bible? Is there somebody in the Bible by the name of Onesiphorus? Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And let's consider hospitality through the eyes of Onesiphorus in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 16 to 18. And what we'll see here is hospitality demonstrated to the shut in. We've seen the sick, we've seen the servants, and now in the third place, hospitality can be demonstrated to the shut-ins. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 16, the text says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, that's probably how you say that man's name, for, you see, for you say why, he, Onesiphorus, oft refreshed me. And was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. Verse 18 says, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. Perhaps he's referring to the judgment day. And in how many things he ministered unto me. Whoa. At Ephesus. Look on your Bible map and see how far his Rome is from Ephesus. He got around. Thou knowest very well. Paul, see where he says my chain, but when he was in Rome, Paul is most likely referencing his first Roman imprisonment as recorded in Acts 28, 30, and 31. However, it could be that Paul is referencing the immediate time frame of 2 Timothy during what appears to be his second and final Roman imprisonment. Now, regardless of whether it's the first Roman imprisonment, second Roman imprisonment, that's kind of irrelevant because what's the point? When he was in Rome, what happened? What did he say? He sought me out. Back up to verse 16. Off refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain, implying that at the time Paul was imprisoned in some capacity. Well, you look at that as a shut-in. That's fair. That's reasonable. But when he was in Rome, he did what? Sought me out. But then it says, there's a modifier, very diligently, and then what? Found me. Now, don't you see that Onesiphorus served the Apostle Paul so that Paul could turn around and serve others? You know, it's easy to think many times, if you're like me, of Paul and the other apostles as bulletproof supermen who needed nothing but Jesus Christ. All they needed was Jesus, and they were good to go. This shows that Paul was a human being too. And not only was Paul a human being, but we're all human beings. And you know what all human beings need, especially those who are shut in? They need a little bit of refreshing, don't they? They need a little bit of encouragement. What does hospitality look like? It kind of looks like what Onesiphorus did for the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? Wouldn't you say? Indeed. Indeed it would. Now, the apostles needed companionship and encouragement, and they received it, didn't they? They received it from whom? They received it from faithful men like Onesiphorus. There's a whole lot we could say about Onesiphorus, but what's the point of this sermon? What does hospitality look like? It's far more than just saying, I'll pray for you. 
What is it? It's helping to meet the needs of people by our generosity and kindness. Observations. You ought to look back at that text. See the words refreshed, not ashamed, sought and found, ministered, and such like. What does hospitality look like? Friends, hospitality is like a breath of fresh air to those who cannot get out and about the way they once did. The Apostle Paul, at some point in time, had his freedom revoked for the gospel of Christ. Now, I don't know anybody who's had their freedom revoked for the gospel of Christ, but I know people who cannot get out and about the way that they once did. Do you? So what are we to do? Pray for them. That's fine. What did Onesiphorus do? What did he do? Who knows where Onesiphorus lived? Did he live in Rome? I don't know. If he did, he somehow got to Ephesus. Did he live in Ephesus? I don't know, but somehow he got to Rome. That's more than just a trip down the street, isn't it? I assure you, you look at your Bible maps. Ephesus and Rome are not just driving from Lexington to Thomasville. It's far, far different. Friends, phone calls, texts, emails, cards in the mail. All those things are nice and thoughtful and appreciated. No doubt about it. But there is nothing that can ever take the place of face-to-face human interaction. Nothing. Phone calls, great. Texts, great. Cards in the mail, great. That's, all that's nice. Don't get me wrong. What does hospitality look like? Did Onesiphorus send a card? Did he send an email? Did he send a text? What did he do? What does hospitality look like according to the scripture? He went where Paul was. What was Paul at the time? He was a prisoner for the gospel's sake. But what's what's something we can look at similar, though not the same? A shut-in. He couldn't get out and about the way that he did. So Onesiphorus didn't wait on Paul to come to him. Onesiphorus went to the apostle Paul. That's what hospitality looks like. You know, it does no one any good at all to be a lover of hospitality and to remain lost in personal sin. All the kindness, generosity, and hospitality in the world cannot erase the stain of one sin. Some people think that because I'm going to show hospitality to people that that's going to forgive me of all my sins. Wrong. Lack of hospitality might cause us to be lost. But if we're trying to demonstrate hospitality and we have not contacted the soul redeeming blood of Jesus Christ, we're still lost in our sins. We need to be added by the Lord to the church. Do you know what the Bible teaches we must do? In order to have our sins washed away, we must hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17. Believe the gospel, John 8, 24. Repent of sin, Acts 3, 19. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10, be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And if that's not plain enough, read 1 Peter 3, 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we've been added by the Lord to the church when we obey that pattern of doctrine. Acts 2, 41, Acts 2, 47. And we're to remain faithful unto death. That means we need to be, as Christians, faithful in hospitality. But you know what happens? Sometimes we're not always as faithful as we need to be. And we sin. Is there any hope for a sinning saint? Oh, yes, absolutely. Acts 8.22 says, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray thou. If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Wherever you are, come as together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.